The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome to the Women in Depth podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Fiato. Join me as we explore the inner lives of women, their struggles, fears, hopes, and dreams. We'll go beneath the surface and take a deeper look at what is hidden, unknown, uncertain, and uncomfortable. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. My guest today is Dr. Sean Fitzpatrick. Sean is the executive director of the Jung Center in Houston, Texas. He has master's degrees in religious studies and clinical psychology. Sean also completed his doctorate in psychology with a concentration in Jungian studies at Saybrook University. He is also a psychotherapist in private practice and is a senior fellow of the American Leadership Forum. Hi, Sean, and welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really grateful for this moment, this time that we're going to have today. Um, For our listeners who are not aware, you and I have had connections through the Jung Center. We were both working on our doctoral programs at around the same time. And so this is, in a way, a a full circle moment. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit of a reunion, and uh, and as we were we were talking in, uh, a little bit before the interview, I it's uh, that that program was very important to me, and and uh, and really really informs how I work as a clinician and and how I see the world. And lovely to share that foundation with you as we have this conversation. Thank you, and and yes, uh, you know the Union Studies program was profoundly impactful, life changing for me. So yes, I agree with you with that. And so today, we're going to be talking about fathers. <laughs> and this topic actually uh, came to my attention because I was on Facebook, and I saw a posting about a talk that you were going to be giving about fathers. It was called Reconsidering the Father. Before we delve into our topic, you know, how are you drawn to this focus? Well, uh, th- that's a good question. Um, I am a father. I am a son. Uh, one of our one of our instructors, Lourdes uh, uh, Pittman McGee, who's a, a pretty pretty well known Jungian analyst, uh, has been a, a a kind of archetypal father for me, and I'll I'll explain that term here in a little bit. He's been a, a really important in my life, and he introduced me. We were at an event, and we ran into some people that didn't know that we knew each other. And one of the people said, "Well, Pittman, what did you what did you know about this?" you know, this young man when you met him when he was a student, because I, I was a student at the university when he was teaching a class. And he said, well, the first thing that was obvious to me is that he had a huge father complex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and, I'll, and I'll unpack that a little bit. Uh, he, was, he said it with great love. Uh, I had a... Uh, just just a a bit of biography or just a, a sketch i had a, a mother and father who remained married until my father passed away about 7 years ago and and my father was a deeply principled man and showed up as a father he showed up physically he was a scout leader and took us camping and did father son things um, which are coded maybe a little bit different than father daughter things, and we can talk about that, um, like throwing the football around and um, engaging in sports and things. But he wasn't emotionally, he wasn't available, uh, is the sort of the language we might use today. He didn't know how to express love, and I think it was something, it was something he approached almost in a theoretical way. And so, and I certainly felt that as a, as a child growing up, and. I was able to talk through a lot of that with him, and as he aged, he uh, deepened in emotional maturity and began to become more curious about some of these things himself. But you know, the distance that I experienced with him uh, as a child made an impact on me. And as I aged, I found myself connecting strongly with um, older men who were, in their ways, very positive. I don't want to say surrogate fathers, but they were. Um, 
archetypal fathers. They were people who helped get my needs met in a certain way. And there's a quote from Stephen Colbert. I don't know if your listeners know, know Stephen Colbert, but he said, America, America used to be, you know, our motto used to be father knows best. Now we're lucky if father knows he has children. Huh. And, you know, yeah. and the role of the role of father has kind of been for very good reason has been critiqued, uh, taken apart with the, and we can take it back hundreds of years, actually, we can take it back a long way. But if you talk just about the last hundred years, the place of a male figure in a family, and even a, even an idea like that, that a family has to be a man and a woman, and they have some sort of legal union, right? And that's where into which children are, are born and raised and that that's the model for healthy human development has been challenged and it's been challenged on in terms of social broad sweeping social changes and challenged in uh, academic settings and research settings and both with the women's movement and the gay liberation movement uh, we have seen our understanding of family uh, altered considerably and I would say that the father the father's role in particular has been really and not exactly thrown into chaos but it's difficult to say what a father is or does we can talk biologically about a mother right so a, a mother is the human being who gives birth to a child a father on the other hand a father is a sperm donor uh, <laughs> A father makes possible a biological, you know, occurrence in the woman's body. But then beyond that, his role is kind of determined by uh, society, by his own intention about being a father, uh, showing up or not showing up, being present in the child's life, can be uh, influenced a lot by his partner. It's just not as clear on the level of society what a father is or has to be anymore. I use this idea of the archetypal father. So archetype is a fancy pants Jungian word for an idea that that we have these ancient patterns in human development. Uh, Old, it's, it's literally archetype means old pattern or old type. One way of thinking about them is that when we're born into the world, we have certain almost not exactly hardwired, but almost hardwired expectations. There are needs that we have as human beings when we enter the world. And they're they're very simple, particularly when we're first born, where you know, we need safety and nourishment and shelter. Uh, the uh, literature on attachment, which your listeners may or may not be familiar with, has suggests that we we very much need close a close relationship with you know with an adult caregiver, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, that conveys warmth and and again safety and closeness and that's those are old. Those have been with us for you know the two million years that human beings have been on the planet. They've grown and developed over time. That those needs need to be fulfilled, and we've created a, a symbol for them in the form of the mother. Right. This this extraordinary process of bringing life into existence and then bringing it into the world and making sure that this new human being survives to the point when they can take up their own task of survival in the world. And, and, you know, if we talk in, well, you know, the terms of evolution, you know, we're supposed to propagate the species, right? Bring it onto the next generation. Father's, father's roles. There's a, 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 a writer named Luigi Zoya. He's a uh, an Italian psychologist, and he's, his name is spelled in a very strange way if your listeners are trying to find it. Um, it's uh, His last name is Z-O-J-A. Okay. Uh, Luigi Zoya. And he, he says, you know, every act of paternity is an adoption, that there's a choice that goes on in terms of how the paternity the the male, if it's a male, is going to be engaged in the life of the child. Uh, And and maybe even a negotiation with the child's quote unquote primary caregiver. Now that primary caregiver may be a male, maybe a male parent or a male guardian or so on. 
culturally, over time, we have come to assign certain functions to fathers that are also reflective of universal human needs. Things like uh, learning how to become independent, uh, self-reliant, learning how to learn, learning uh, self-discipline, and, and, and discipline literally means to learn. Right. Mm. To become if we're if we're self-disciplined, that means we're learning from ourselves. And we've also certainly over the course of the development of Western civilization had this very what we would call patriarchal way of understanding uh, the culture that in some way this male parent, this father is actually the one who's in charge <laughs> of of everything and and has the power to uh, over everyone's lives in one way or another and is more important you know and for for in all of our civilizations including the american civilization at the beginning the fathers the parent the males were the ones who got to vote and the women didn't right. you know but that's very different in the 21st century there aren't these great social i don't know uh, uh, borders, boundaries, you know, uh, uh, structures, foundations that sort of yeah. hold up the father. That's all gone. And fatherhood is at a time when it needs to be, I think, really looked at, taken apart, looked at and say, well, what, what value does this idea continue to have for us? And for those of us who are called father, you know, my dad call, or my son calls me dad, daddy all the time. That means something. And it means something very different than it did when I called my dad, dad. <laughs> now, this is just, just so fascinating, Sean, because, you know, as you were speaking, um, called to mind a conversation, a podcast a conversation. I had quite a few episodes back with, um, Dr. Dr. James Hollis, and he referenced a book. I can't remember it now, but it was something like, this is only for men, but only 17% of men at the time this book was written expressed having a positive relationship with their father. Yeah. And the impact that that would have on a man, on a family, on, on society, on relationships, just how far reaching this is. And then a few months ago, I also spoke with one of the directors for the Mankind Project, and mm -hmm. you know their work is focused on exploring and supporting men in, in the question of what does it mean to be a man? And and I think that this idea of what is the meaning of father um, is very much intertwined with these same questions of what does it mean to be a man? How does that relate to being a father? So very, very deep questions that we don't ever really think about until we actually sit with them as, as we are here, and yet they are yeah. profoundly impacting lives. I absolutely agree. And there's some uh, synchronicity or there's a meaningful coincidence for me in the in that uh, that you were talking with somebody from the Mankind Project. Yeah. The workshop, the, the first draft of this workshop uh, that I did was prepared for the Mankind Project. Oh, really? Yeah. The, <laughs> wow. Yeah, the, uh, um, because the elders were uh, of the local community here were looking for they were looking for a way to talk about the relationships of father and son. And, uh, and when the organizers came to me to, to ask about it, it was really charged with uh, an awareness of the woundedness of the men around this. That, yeah. You know, what drew them to something like the Mankind Project often had to do with their problematic relationship with their fathers. And uh, the very limited horizons that men of earlier generations had in terms of being able to do things that have been traditionally coded either maternal or feminine. Things like having emotions, <laughs> <laughs> talking about them, touching your children um, in a way that isn't violent or punitive. It's different now. And I think a lot of men and i want to take a I want to well let me just make a clarification like so i think a lot of men who are fathers find uh in in who are fathers of children now of underage children now minors now um have much more freedom of expression the uh, of these you know, of, of affection and uh, um, love and physical connection and some of the other things that have been coded feminine than previous generations have. I also, though, I want to be clear, and I don't know that this is a, a useful point to bring up at this point, but 
one of the ways in which I think about fathering is, you know, we talked about it as an archetypal need. So we need fathering or we need the kinds of experiences that we've called fathering. We can also think of it as an archetypal need to express to express these kinds of capacities to to nurture younger people. Uh, And they don't have to be chronologically younger. They can maybe be emotionally younger or intellectually younger or so on in a certain way. But that doesn't have to be tied up with gender. Mm, Yeah. And I think that's where we are right now in the conversation around father is that father historically has been a male parent. And those are all our images of fathering in the culture are a male parent. And that's limiting the field far too much. The fathers in my life are great to hear you, really wonderful to hear you talking about Jim Hollis because he was the most important, is the most important man in my adult life. Um, I happen to be sitting at his desk right now um, (laughs) um, because he was the director of the Young Center before I was. And um, he's not my dad. And also he instilled... Uh, he really taught me what self-discipline looked like and and how to be true to who I am and my own call for how to be in the world, right? My right. how to how to listen closely to who I need to be, not who other people need me to be, and to stay true to that. So Jim is one of those people for me, but also You know, I think of Edith Wishagrod, who was a professor of mine um, the first time I was in graduate school. And she's a woman, you know, and uh, she was an absolutely, I could call an intellectual father. I don't need to call her a mother. She taught me how she brought me into a kind of initiation, right? Into an intellectual initiation where I was, certain things were expected of me. And I was held with just enough safety that, I wouldn't destroy myself or others along the way, but not so much safety that there wasn't real risk. Yeah. I owe so much to her. And she was, she wasn't my dad and she wasn't a man. I love the nuances that you are pointing out as far as, you know, it's not about gender and that there are varied experiences that fall under what it means to, to be a father or the experience of fathering. And before I go into my next question, Sean, I have to tell you it's another synchronicity, but um, I have to say that James Hollis is also the same for me as far as being, you know, the most significant male experience um, as far as my growth and healing and, you know, really was significant for me. You know, feel feel very, yeah. very fortunate to have crossed paths with him. He's, I'm, so, I'm so glad to hear that, and he's a really special human being, and your listeners don't necessarily need to listen to his rave about Jim Hollis anymore. And <laughs> I, and if you haven't encountered his books, I, I just please seek him out. Seek him out on Amazon or uh, James Hollis. He has a new book called Living an Examined Life. And of all things, Lourdes, I don't know if you saw this, he's on uh, Oprah.com. I know, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Quoting Marcus Aurelius yeah. at length. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I saw so that, cool. and I just chuckled yeah. to myself. So, um, <laughs> so Sean, I think we're, you were, we're talking about this already, but I wanted to, you know, you you titled your talk, you know, reconsidering the father, and and everything we're describing right now is a reconsideration of of the father and what it means to be a father. You, you're, you're beginning to you know to share more about the significance of the father, but. What was your process of, of choosing this title? There's probably an honest answer that, <laughs> that involves <laughs> that involves a deadline and, uh, and, and just <laughs> okay. yes. scrambling for something catchier and not finding it. I, I guess a, another, another way of answering it is that along the lines of what we've been talking about, that father is not simply a relationship with a specific human being, right? The experience of father is not limited to that. And it's something that what has been collected under this symbol of father over, you know, millions of years of human experience are absolutely essential experiences for us to have in the contemporary world. But we need to navigate 
how we've limited father to a biological male human being who's related to us, who has specifically adopted us or has, you know, donated their sperm to the act of you know, creation or because we have many of us have have less than perfect relationships with uh, our fathers of origin um, uh, to uh, down to great violence or uh, experiences of abandonment. Not just to beat up on fathers, of course, all kinds of people can fail us in our lives, mothers too, and others, and we can have compassion for them as being suffering human beings. I think, you know, one of the, the, the real insights of this perspective, and it's not mine, it's, it comes from Jung and probably Jim Hollis said it at some point, but <laughs> that no single human being is capable, uh, is will get you all of the things that you need. No single human parent, um, no, will will get you what you need. And there's a, psych- a psychologist named uh, D. W. Winnicott who's not alive anymore. Uh, Winnicott had a, a phrase, a, f- a famous phrase, which he called "good enough mothering." He said, "You know, parents, a perfect parent would fail us on an entirely different level because we would never have experiences of lack." You know, and experiences of needing to learn things for ourselves and soothe ourselves when we don't have, you know, when we experience pain and so on and so forth. What we need is a good enough mother. We need a mother who's there most of the time, a mother who's there to take care of the basic needs that we have and can uh, gives us enough, again, safety, security and encouragement to become um, confident in ourselves without overwhelming us. The same is true of fathering, that we need, we need to have good enough fathering. And the fathering that we don't necessarily get from a single person uh, that we have a, a fantasy about in this culture, this this the nuclear family and the man in the house and so on, that actually we can get it in lots of places. We can get it from other human beings and we can get it uh, from institutions, you know, and books and and intentional acts of, you know, not, I don't want to lean too much on the word discipline, but training and and shaping ourselves and taking seriously our uh, our unique call to be in the world. And so, some of these experiences that you're describing, these are experiences that would fall under the symbol or the meaning of 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 fathering or being a father? You mean, for example, um, experiences that help us to become more independent, experiences that force us to to grow out of discomfort. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding it and also mm-hmm. it's clear for our listeners what we mean. Yeah. And you know what? That is part of the problem, Lourdes. And I think that's another reason why we I call the, the workshop Reconsidering the Father. Because we have a, a collection of associations with it that actually, when I've done these workshops, and I probably I expect that I'll do more of them over time. One of the exercises I do is I, I get people to get together in groups and just off the top of their head brainstorm, what is it to be, what is a father? What does a father do? And I find it really encouraging now because people will list these kinds of attributes that we talk about, which is learning how to be independent, learning how to survive in the world, self-discipline. and But they'll also list things like nurturing, affection, care and concern, and, and modeling these, mm-hmm. like being in touch with your emotion and so on and so forth. So I think our our cultural image of father is is shifting, but it also makes it a bit muddy yeah. um, to talk about it. So what I would say about that is that we have to be take a critical stance and whenever we're consuming culture, whenever you know, we're watching a movie or reading a book, we have to take a critical stance to the notion of father and say, okay, well, what era was this in? And what did, what did that look like in that period of time that they would use this word father to refer to this person? And a special case in this regard for me, I, you know, I was raised Catholic. And, uh, and so important men in my life have been Catholic priests who we call father. And I'm not a practicing Catholic. Um, anymore, and I still have really close relationship with, with at least at the moment one Roman Catholic priest. We have this cultural uh, expectation that fathers are going to do and be certain things for us, and it sh- it shifts subtly from context to context what those things are. 
I might take a, just a step back and uh, to Luigi Zoya. Absolutely. Which is, uh, I'm going to, this is not, uh, this is his translation of, but he's talking about a figure from Greek myth named uh, Hector. Homer, the poet Homer, Greek poet Homer wrote two epics, and one of them is called the Iliad and the other is the Odyssey. And the Iliad is the story of the the fall of Troy, the the sea. Well, I'd actually, I don't think that it actually happened in the book, but the siege of Troy. So these Greek heroes go to um, to Troy for reasons that are totally not worth going into to, <laughs> to tell the story. Okay. And they fight for 10 years. But what's important is that the great Trojan hero's name is Hector. And Luigi Zoya points out this moment in Hector's story as being really important for us to understand what, what we want fathering to be right and it's for me as a dad as a psychotherapist as a son as so on and so forth what i would want fathering to be so hector has this moment when he's he's walking through this city he he comes across his wife and his young son uh who really is a child and he's wearing his full battle dress hector is hector is the leader of the trojans he has he has his helmet on and he has all of his armor on and his son looks at him and is terrified, is scared, starts crying and runs behind his mother's skirts. And Hector laughs about this and he takes off his helmet. And when he takes off his helmet, then his son recognizes him as, as dad, right? As this human being that I know and I love. And so then Hector makes this prayer. He lifts his son in his arms and he says, Zeus and you other gods who can hear my prayer, Grant that this child, this boy of mine, may grow up to be as I am, outstanding among the Trojans, strong and brave, and rule over Troy with great power. And let people say of him, he is a better man than his father was. Luigi, in his book, also has a photograph, which I have used in the workshop and in other contexts. It's a photograph of a man a uh, contemporary man in this like 1970s or 80s. I don't know when it was taken. And you see his back and he's got jeans on and he's, he's bare chested. And he's got a child who looks like she, he or she is about five or six years old. And he's thrown the child up into the air uh, above his head. And the child has both of his, his or her legs out and both of his or her arms out like, like you know, like she's flying. And there's no physical contact between the two of them. And for Zoya, he's saying, this is father, right? It's, and you see in the image, the trust and the, 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 the child and the father's strength and capacity, right? To catch him or her and is able to be free in that moment, right? Completely free. And I think this is what we're, this is what we're searching for, and we want more experiences like that. I, I just I think Hector's prayer is a beautiful evocation of that. That the child is the child becomes m- more than I am. That what I want is not to cut off their development or be competitive or jealous or so on and so forth. And we can talk a little bit about the, the darker side of this, Lord, if it's yeah. useful. But but we want to raise raise them up, and they move forward in the world. And move forward into the into the future with strength and purpose and 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 without dependency. Yeah, and I can see you know that image you shared that's powerful of you know the child being you know up in the air and knowing that the father is there to catch them and how that knowing it does allow that child to grow into an adult who can go out into the world knowing that he will land on his feet or he will be caught. You know, just from just because of that experience of being fathered, how that follows yeah. him into the world, yeah. it it makes such a difference. I, I um I have permission to share this this story. I, um, actually, I, I, she was just sitting with me uh, an hour ago in my office, and um, I've shared this story of hers before. I work with a client whose father, she she grew up in what we. We would say, at a minimum, we would say it was an extremely restrictive religious environment. Um, we could go further and say it was a kind of cult. 
and where um, it was very patriarchal in the sense that the fathers controlled everything and the role of the man and the role of the um, male pastor was absolute. And my client struggled hugely as a as a child in this environment as a servant kind of the the boys in the family and the father and 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 so on and it was finally time for her to leave and her parent her dad objected to her leaving the community and she pled with him she just pleaded with him she said dad i i just i need your blessing like i need you to tell me that i can leave and survive in the world you know, I can, yeah. I can leave this place and he wouldn't do it. Wow. And, and what he said was so sad to me. I, I mean, I've been really angry for her for a long time, but, but so sad too. And then he said, you know what? You just have the wrong father. He said, I don't, I don't believe that anyone can. Wow. The difference between giving, getting that message that yes, you can. Yeah. And I'm going to be here to help you get to the place where you can do it um, versus no, you can't. And it's had a, had a had a catastrophic effect on 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 my client, and she's she's basically had to reinvent the father for herself. So, Sean, maybe this would be a good segue to speak a little bit about some of the dark. You know, you, you talked about the dark side of this, or some of the consequences, or the sacrifices, or the cost of not having that experience, or that experience is um, lacking some significant components. Yeah. And again, I would lean back on, I mean, I think the story of my client is pretty direct. I would lean back on, on some stories from mythology about this too. So the, in the Greek mythology, there was a generation of, of gods before the ones we're used to talking about, we're used to talking about Zeus, excuse me, and Hera and Poseidon and Hades and so on. Well, there were two, there were two generations prior to that. And there, there was there was the original mother and father. There was Gaia and Uranus, and Uranus had to be. See if I'm remembering my mythology correctly. <laughs> in, in in both cases, so Uranus was so threatened by his children that he wouldn't let them be released. And in order for them to be released, uh, Chrono, from from Mother Earth, right from Gaia, in order for them to be released, Kronos, who is this second generation, um, had to slice off. Uh, had to slice off his phallus, right? So, so that, so that uh, to release his siblings from from the mother, because father was so threatened by the power of his children and so worried about being us- usurped. Well, so then this repeats itself in the next generation, in that Kronos has the exact same fear, and his wife has to get his children, Zeus. I, th- I think it was Zeus who did this. To uh, it's a different, a different a bit of trickery, but likewise to trick their to trick their father into into releasing them into the world. So when we talk about archetype, there's a dark side to the archetype, which is that there's an old pattern of fathers being threatened by the power of their children, and it plays out too in the story of Oedipus, in which. You know, the king, uh, Oedipus's father, finds out he get there's a prophecy that his son is going to kill him and marry and marry uh, his wife or the child's mother. And so the father can't allow this to happen and takes and tells one of his servants to take the child and kill it. And in that era, it would have been ex- by exposing it to the elements. You just basically take it out in the middle of a field and left, leave it out to die. Well, the, the servant wouldn't do that and gave it to some shepherds and shepherds gave it to this, you know, royal couple in another part of the of the area who, who were childless. And so Oedipus was raised believing that his adoptive parents were his real parents. And as the story goes, then, of course, Oedipus finds out that he was fated to kill his father and marry his mother. So he goes as far away from this as possible. He says, I have to leave you for my safety or for your safety. And he he goes to his, he, he meets his father, his real father on a crossroads and, and there's an altercation and he kills him. And then he finds himself in this strange kingdom, which actually is his home and finds this grieving, this grieving queen who he marries. There's a sense in which we can't, the Oedipus story is interesting because it again reflects this dynamic of the fear of the of the parent of the child, and particularly the fear of the father of the child's power, the fear of the child's independence, the fear, in a sense, of our our immortality, 
I feel it right now with my son. My son is nine, almost 10 years old. And we play, sometimes we play video games together. We play um, Madden, uh, which is a football game, uh, Madden on the Xbox. And when I started playing this game with him, we got it around Christmas time. I just beat him routinely, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I have... I have, I have much more skill and football knowledge and boom, 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 boom. And I know how to use the controller. <laughs> well, in six months, man, the worm has turned. Uh, <laughs> and he is. And so we were hanging out this weekend playing. And and every time he scored, he just beat the tar out of me. He just, boy, he <laughs> beat the stuff out of me. And every time he'd win, he'd stand up and he'd go, yes, and he'd dab and he'd, he'd do this dance and he, you know, and so we're trying, trying to get him to understand what good sportsmanship is, but also like that exuberance yeah. of, I did it. I'm better than you, yeah. you know, you dad who has been, has this power that is so extraordinary that it's terrifying to me. You know, yeah. to, to children, parents are like gods, you know, we can do all these things that they can't do and um, we can make magic happen. And we were, res you know, we're, we're responsible for their being here and for their survival. And to have that sudden rush of <laughs> power that like, yeah. I, I can do something better than you. Well, you know, I'm a psychotherapist and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And well adjusted, and <laughs> I can you know revel in Danny's power, and I've yeah. you know read Luigi Zoya's book, and also there's a little pinch there, <laughs> you know. Yeah. When yeah. he's throwing the football to me out in the front yard, and I you know my 230 pound body has to juke, <laughs> you know, yeah. he just skates by me, you know. That's my mortality. Like I know. I'm, yeah. I'm 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 no longer going to have the kind of power that he. He has waiting for him. And you can see how the, you know, his besting of you, his um, outplaying you or triumphing over dad, how that um, strengthens him and empowers him. Yeah, that's uh, that's my hope, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, one of the questions that I saw that you, you posed, you pose in these workshops is the question of how was I fathered? Why is the answer to this question significant? For the individual, I, one of the things I say uh, often in therapy and in other contexts as well um, is that it's, it never fails to amaze me how much of the work of change involves being aware. So, uh, and I have no statistical evidence to back this up. I pick the number arbitrarily, but it's a felt number, which is like it's like ninety percent of the work is simply being aware of what my experience is in any given moment. How I was interrogating, learn, really looking at how I was fathered can do a variety of things. One, of course, it can be very, is that it can be very difficult. It can be difficult to look at the ways I was fathered and maybe the ways that I wasn't fathered or wasn't fathered adequately. But it, it gives us, it, it basis a, a level. So we can move forward. So we can say, okay, you know what? Either, you know, these are the things that I got from my father uh, and, and or my whoever showed up for me in these ways. And these are the things I didn't get. And that's what I need. Or it can be an affirmation, really affirming process. We say, you know what, I, I, I value this human being in a different way than I did before. And I can see in myself the, the, the qualities that really animated his life or her or her life, these, you know, these people who may have provided us these things. But it's it's really, I think, first of all, about level setting. You know, how was I, how was I fathered? Let's be honest about it. And from there we can move forward. And so when you're moving forward and and you have a good idea of this, you know, how you were fathered or how you weren't or, or what that pro experience was, what are some of the ways to to work with this information that you have? You know, I, I, we're two therapists talking to each other. It's very, very easy to say, well, you know, <laughs> a, a therapist can be a therapist can be a good option. Right. I, I, you know, I believe that it, and that is if there is a place in which you are uh, stuck or, or wounded, really hurting and difficult to get past 
Um, or, you know, in a more general way, you're struggling to function in the ways that fathers would help us with. It might be helpful to, 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 to consult a professional, but also it's it, more generally speaking, it's to begin to look for ways to have experiences that would continue the process of archetypal fathering, right? No human being is, I'm going to be a need to be fathered until the day I die. And ideally I'm internalizing that. Ideally, I'm internalizing a voice that helps me determine what is the path that leads to my you know, survival, living in integrity um, uh, with my values and, and with my call. And it may be that I get that, uh, again, to go back to Jim Hollis, Jim Hollis talks about reading Marcus Aurelius. I don't, please listeners, you don't have to read Marcus Aurelius <laughs> on a daily basis. Jim's a literature professor, and that's the kind of answer you would expect from, from a literature ex- professor. <laughs> But he's in his late seventies, and he's still reaching out for that kind of guidance. So uh, you can do it through structured experiences that you seek out. You know, I sought out um, mentors quite consciously over time, and I fell into mentoring relationships just by chance over time with other people, people in my life. Even I would say, you know, there have been times in my life when um, my, you know, my spouse who happens to be a woman, my wife, you know, has been present for me in the ways a father would be present for me. And in a way that didn't blur lines or, you know, yeah. it didn't I don't make her my father, but she was present for me at a time when I really needed to stand up for myself and, and take control of, of what was right for me. Um, so it doesn't just have to be a biological parent that you work this stuff out with. Yeah, that's really helpful because I think, you know, again, when when we're talking about this, there can be that tendency to to think of, you know, I guess the stereotypical aspects of fatherhood or being a father, but knowing that you can be that father to yourself in some ways, as you describe that voice that is there for guidance or to help you, you know, in a navigate a difficult situation, and then the people in our lives who can help us to experience this, and that it doesn't remain limited to gender. I think that for me, and to get back to the question you had earlier about why reconsidering the father, I think it's because I needed to reconsider the father, and that and that was that has been in talking about these things with people. That's been the core takeaway: is we're not we're talking about a, a set of experiences that I want to have, and that I need to have, and 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 they can come from many different places uh, and many different kinds of people, and I can seek them out. You know, Sean, you had mentioned earlier, and I guess, you know, when you were preparing for our conversation, some examples from movies that exemplify some of the things that we've talked about. Could you share a few yeah. of those? I'm a huge fan of the, the film Moonlight, which came out a, a year before last and won the Oscar for Best Picture. It's also the least seen Best Picture wow. winner. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, seek it out, and it's. I think what it does a fantastic job of is, it, it, particularly in its first third, is but actually through the whole movie, showing you what it looks like for somebody who was not fathered and is trying to find that in the world, and in 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 good enough ways does find it. And uh, in particular, there's a scene in which a a sort of a surrogate father or an archetypal father shows up for this boy and uh, gives the two of them, I think, really give each other important experiences of fathering. And they're not related to each other. I really recommend that film. I actually love Lincoln, the Steven Spielberg film from a few years ago, as the as the benevolent patriarch and their specific scenes of him interacting with his children that are are beautiful and, and are I think meant to be expressive of American fathering what is particularly American about fathering and an, another movie that I have talked about or used in the workshop is uh, the movie The Descendants which has got George Clooney in it it shows a father who as he call he says very early in the movie he says i was the backup parent and you know and his <laughs> wife his wife has an accident and he has to come online and and as a parent and so it's a father kind of finding his way as a parent and i'll mention one more movie uh, just as a reference point for people it's very good 
and also difficult to watch. It's called Affliction, and it's got Nick Nolte and uh, James Coburn and Sissy Spacek in it. And uh, I think James Coburn won an Oscar for his portrayal of really a negative, devouring, Kronos-like father. It's a it's a tough watch. It's very good. It's based on a, a novel by Russell Banks, which is also very good. And Sean, we will put all of the Zoya's book, also these movie titles that you've mentioned. We'll make sure to include these in the show notes so that listeners can seek these out if they're interested. Great. Great. And I just want to thank you for taking the time today to have this uh, very important conversation with me and for, the, for our listeners. I know that it will resonate with many. It really has been my pleasure, Lourdes. Thank you so much for asking me to do this. It's been, uh, it's been really meaningful for me. Thank you. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to the Women in Depth podcast. I hope it brings you a deeper understanding of yourself and others and that you found some insights that illuminated and inspired. You can follow Women in Depth on Facebook and YouTube, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. And finally, if you enjoy Women in Depth, please share with a friend. Again, thank you so much for listening, and see you next time.